it, how they got it, and why the great many who lacked it might have a decent claim to a bigger share of it. Nigel had started investing his pocket money, as others experimented with a chemistry set, or crueler ones held a magnifying glass over a slug. Mathematical ideas that made practical sense. That was what he liked. He thought about becoming an engineer, but his temperament needed a discipline that had more room for disagreement and debate. He found economics, the art of telling money's stories. Nigel was freer than many in his world because, although he'd made plenty of it and parted with little of it, money had no hold on him. The things that others were compelled to buy were for him an encumbrance, mobile phones, televisions. He preferred his old radio and the antediluvian three-piece suite a friend had given him. During the war, his father, Arthur Wilkins, had worked in a factory making armoured vehicles in Basingstoke, a humdrum town west of London. Afterwards, he became a Methodist lay preacher. Nigel Charles, his second and final child, was born on the hinge of the century, March the 19th, 1950, into a generation for whom frugality, after it ceased to be the only option, became either a penance for others' greater sacrifices or a curse to be lifted with material excess. Nigel's great treat would be a first-class ticket for a long train ride, mainly to savour the complimentary scrambled eggs. Perhaps a bit of cake later, after listening to an edifying talk. At his flat, four floors up in Kensington, a brisk walk from Buckingham Palace or the Royal Parks, less brisk when his chest gave him trouble, he would repair rather than replace. On the mantelpiece stood a photograph of him on a rare holiday aboard a canal boat. The bookshelves were full of economics, finance, international law. Behind the corporate veil, infectious greed, what is Sarban's Oxley? If these were the tools of his vocation, the Thomas Hardy novels were his solace. He turned to them so often that the titles on their cracked spines were scarcely legible. Jude the Obscure was his favourite. Perhaps he saw himself in Jude. Perhaps he felt the meaning of all those heavy books about the functioning of wealth when he reread the passage about the three children. They're found hanging beside a note that reads, Done because we are too many. Nigel had a single self-help volume too, Overcoming Depression. It looked as though it had never been opened. Nigel had been a quiet child, but with adulthood had emerged a distrust of authority that could approach contempt. For university, he'd moved to the ideal place to indulge this antagonistic streak. Manchester, a city whose inhabitants made a joyful art of insubordination and were prepared to suffer for it. They spoke of the Peterloo massacre as if they remembered it. They took pride in the workers who'd accepted destitution as the price of standing against the slave-owning Confederate suppliers of the cotton for their mills. It was Manchester that had engendered the Industrial Revolution and all that flowed from it, including the Labour Party, whose branch in Kensington, where the average income was the highest in the land, would have, in Nigel, an unwavering candidate in its quixotic campaigns to win control of the Municipal Council. His comrades noted his effectiveness as a needler of the powerful and called him the Exocet, a missile that's hard to detect until it detonates. Nigel would joke, a half-joke, it seemed to those who heard it, that he couldn't say what he did for a job because it was secret. He'd studied criminology as well as economics, but for most of his career had done nothing more cloak and dagger than economic research. Bankers would hire him to suggest what the next chapters of money stories might be, and he would sketch the scenarios, projecting himself into the mind of the classical economist's stock character, rational and law-abiding. Then he'd taken a position in the Enforcement Division of the Financial Services Authority, the body that oversaw British banks. Here, he thought at first, he'd finally found his natural habitat. Nigel was a stickler, the sort who never let you get things done the easy way. At the FSA, he'd soon despaired of what he felt was a reluctance to go after financial crime. Happily, at just that moment, there appeared an opportunity for mischief. The sort that brought forth Nigel's flat, tight-lipped smile. But Charlotte Martin was anxious. She knew Nigel better than anyone did. 
They'd met through one of the campaigns Nigel conducted against those he perceived.